Live from Sydney, 7 News with Michael Usher and Angela Cox. Good afternoon and welcome to Seven's continuing coverage of the mass murder at Westfield Bondi Junction. Here is everything we know as we come to you this hour, starting with the victims. Six people are dead. Five are women. One is a man. Among them, 38-year-old mother Ash Good, whose nine-month-old girl is among the 12 patients injured and in hospitals across the city. Dawn Singleton, the daughter of businessman John Singleton and two overseas visitors were also killed. As for the murderer shot dead by police, we know that he's 40-year-old Joel Couchy, a Queensland man believed to be from the Brisbane area. Police say he came to New South Wales last month but don't know what brought him into state. It's uh, believed he had a history of mental health issues. It's unclear how he got his hands on the knife used in the massacre and detectives say he took possession of a small storage facility when he arrived in New South Wales. His family, we understand, are cooperating with the investigation. Let's take you to a press conference with the Assistant Commissioner of Queensland Police speaking after it was revealed the crazed knife man was from the Brisbane area. Police force investigation into the horrific crimes that have occurred in Bondi overnight. Certainly our organisation expresses our thoughts and condolences uh, with the family and friends of the victims involved in this horrific tragedy. It would have been extremely confronting for everyone, including our first response officers and those persons in the shopping centre during this event and those who have attended the scene. The information we have from the intelligence we have in Queensland, which we have shared with New South Wales Police in a cooperative manner, is that the person involved in the horrific crime uh, has acted alone and there's no ongoing threat uh, to our community. Uh, we have worked closely with the New South Wales Police Service yesterday evening, overnight uh, and today to share information and intelligence uh, and assist with the investigations so that the New South Wales Police can undertake their complex investigations into this event, uh, certainly in their preparation for a coronial brief for the New South Wales State Coroner. Uh, we understand that these investigations take time uh, and the success is dependent on the cooperation of all agencies involved to share the intelligence, uh, particularly where this individual uh, has been a resident of Queensland uh, and is considered a person from Queensland. He's a 40-year-old man, as you're aware, and certainly the name uh, has been released. Uh, he is a person whom has been identified as being known to the Queensland Police Service. Uh, in that regard, whilst the investigations are in their infancy and we're still conducting uh, thorough investigations to assist New South Wales. I can say that the man has never been arrested by police in Queensland, nor has he been charged with any criminal offence. Uh, he has been in contact with the police, primarily in, in the last uh, four to five years would be the most uh, contact we have had with him. During that contact, we are aware that this individual has suffered from mental health. We are liaising with this man's family in Queensland and we have spent yesterday uh, evening, last night and today with the family uh, in delivering the message regarding their son uh, and assisting them with regards to providing information to the New South Wales Police Force. The family have cooperated with the Queensland Police Service uh, in this regard and they are issuing a statement on their behalf with respect to their own condolences and thoughts to the family and friends of those victims involved in this tragedy. Equally, they have sent a message to the New South Wales Police Force with respect to support of the police officer who has killed their son and expressing their concerns for her welfare. As you can appreciate, this is a major investigation uh, and in response to when the Bondi event occurred, uh, the Queensland Police Service and the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner considered the safety of Queensland in the first instance. Uh, and we can change our posture uh, in the community in terms of an increased police presence uh, in shopping centres to ensure that Queenslanders are safe and Queenslanders feel safe. And we'll continue to increase that police presence uh, to make sure the community understands uh, they are supported and we are there to make sure they are safe. In saying that, we have no intelligence or concerns 
of an increased threat environment within shopping centres or the general public within the Queensland environment. But as a precaution, we certainly have increased our footprint. And we'll continue to do so to make sure that Queenslanders are kept safe. Do you have any questions? What well, was his last known address in Queensland and where has he lived here? So from the contact with the family, I can say uh, this gentleman has been an itinerant over the last few years. He has moved uh, from Brisbane, Kangaroo Point, Carina, uh, and back, back to his family's residence uh, in the Southern Police region. What was the nature of the last interaction QPS had with this man? The last interaction we had with this gentleman, this man, the offender in this instance, was in December 2023, where he was street checked on the Gold Coast. There was no interaction since December 2023 uh, with this gentleman, and from our understanding in speaking to the family, uh, he has been itinerant and has moved to New South Wales. We believe he has been sleeping in a vehicle or backpacks, according to the family's inf information. What? Understanding that the family do not have regular contact with their son. It is periodic contact where he may respond to a text message. And when you said street checked, what do you mean by that? Was he checked over for um, a weapon or something on the street in 2023? So street check is an intelligence gathering report undertaken by the Queensland Police Service when we may come in contact with a person that we deem uh, sufficient to stop and speak to them regarding their behaviour or where they may be in a certain precinct. So for example, um, street check is a way of reporting wanding where we may undertake wanding that we have the powers to do so in the safe night precincts or the transit hubs or on public transport. It's recorded as a street check wandering. wanding. So a street check is an intelligence gathering record by the Queensland Police Service where we may have contact with an individual uh, and the police, through their Q-Light devices uh, in their possession, can record that interaction with people. So he would have been displaying some kind of unusual behaviour to have that happen? Street checks can be recorded for a number of different reasons in respect to contact. You said that the previous interactions indicate that this man has had mental health issues. Can you walk us through in detail what has given it away to Queensland Police that he has mental health issues? Has he been calling in um, police to come visit him or has he um, acted out in any way or injured anyone? Like, what gave it away for police that he has mental health issues? So as you can appreciate, this investigation is for the State Coroner of Queensland and the Queensland Police Service is compiling all the information and intelligence and records we have with respect to our interactions uh, with this person who has committed this crime. In that regard, we will compile all that information for the coroner. We will share and have shared that with the New South Wales Police. So we are still in the process in the infancy of preparing all that material for the New South Wales Police Force. There are media outlets reporting that he had a history of domestic violence here in Queensland. Is that correct? He has not been prosecuted or arrested or charged for any offence within Queensland and he has no record within the courts for a domestic violence order. What about outside of the courts or outside of actual charges? Has he ever been accused of it or had any sort of orders put in place against him? So there's no orders in place. When he was street checked in December, did, did he, was the police officers find him with a knife or has he been uh, discovered with a knife in previous occasions? So as you can appreciate under Queensland law, it is an offence to have in your possession a knife in a public place without reasonable excuse. And the Jack's Law of Wanding legislation allows us in certain circumstances to use the metal detection device to undertake wanding to search persons. Uh, in this regard, if we were to find a person in possession of a knife without reasonable excuse, uh, there's likely to be a prosecution. Uh, and we know that 1,400 people have been charged with 2,500 offences uh, linked to wanding and Jack's Law in Queensland in the last 12 months. In this regard, the person who is subject to the investigations of committing this crime has not been prosecuted for any criminal offence or not been charged with any offence in Queensland. 
and not being found in possession of knives. In the case at that he, the street checks we're talking about. In the case that he's never been prosecuted or charged, but police were aware that he had mental health issues, um, when he went down to live in Sydney, would there be any reason that Queensland police would have to keep track of this person considering he had these mental health issues, or is that not the job of QPS? So the, the state coroner will look at the interactions not only with Queensland Police but all other agencies and that's, that's expected in this type of investigation. The public expects the police and coroner to look at was this event preventable? Is there any systemic issues that would have um, contributed to this? So those are in any coronial investigation and they will form part of the information exchange we will have New South Wales Police and New South Wales Police will travel up here in the very near future to obviously speak to the family as part of their investigation. We have people in our society who suffer from mental health. They go about their days without trouble, without causing these type of crimes. Mental health uh, in society is not a crime. and We do not run an intelligence regime on persons who suffer from mental health. Uh, there would only be an exchange of information if a person were to present such a security risk in society that would, we would need to monitor that behaviour. Understanding under the developments in intelligence gathering um, with the national criminal intelligence system within Australian jurisdictions, information and intelligence is accessible to all states through the NCIS national and criminal intelligence system. So New South Wales Police and Victoria Police uh, where necessary uh, can access uh, intelligence or information regards an individual in Queensland should they need to. How is the family doing? Obviously, their son has committed this horrific act, but he's also died, so it must be incredibly tumultuous for them. Uh, look, it's a difficult time to tell anyone uh, they've lost their son. Their first thoughts for us were to express their concerns regarding the family and victims of these crimes, and in particular, their thoughts around the police officer who had to uh, bravely act in such a manner. So they've issued a public statement with respect to that. Uh, they're assisting us in all elements that they can to gain an understanding of why their son in this particular case uh, allegedly behaved in this manner and killed people in a public place. And that's really to the crux of the investigation New South Wales Police Service will look at. Why would a person behave and act in such a manner? And the coroner will look at how could this be prevented in the future. At the end of the day is, this is not the society we want to live in uh, and anything we can do from the court's agencies to prevent this type of behaviour, we will. So I to the police that are 23, it's been reported that um, the family came forward to police asking if their son was involved. Do you know if that was Queensland Police or New South Wales Police that happened? I can say that the family, when viewed footage of the event on TV, believe that may well have been their son, and they reached out to authorities. And is that because they had concerns that he was capable or he had been displaying some kinds of concerning behaviour? They saw the footage and believed it may well have been their son, so they reached out to assist authorities have, during the evening. Have any of the interactions with Queensland Police been related to domestic violence or threats against women? Or what we, women? <laughs> the interactions have mostly been... This, this gentleman was diagnosed with a mental illness at the age of 17 um, and has had treatment over the years. From our investigations, it would suggest in the last number of years his mental health has declined and that will centre on the investigations we undertake with New South Wales. New South Wales Police Force are the lead agency in doing these inquiries and will provide all the information. And, and those elements will be examined and reviewed. And I understand Queensland Health is additionally uh, issuing a statement to assist. So if there is some sort of history of, of relating to allegations of domestic violence or um, threats or a danger to women? I've already said that there's no order in place with respect to this individual or no action before the courts with the domestic and family violence. The, the entirety of his history will be examined with New South Wales Police Force. Was he ever assessed as a fixated threat? Um, was, he ever assessed, sorry, was he ever assessed by the fixated threat assessment um, you know, unit with police and health authorities? He's not been identified as a fixated threat risk. 
uh, understanding that the Fixed Aided Threat Assessment Centre deals with threats against public office holders. Uh, what employment was he working? No employment to my knowledge. How many times had, um, was he visited um, by police um, in relation to his mental health? Well, mental health is is a theme in the most recent contacts with police. In contact with police, we've identified the individual uh, suffers from mental health. That's on our records and that's information we've shared with New South Wales and that will form the basis of their investigation uh, and understanding why in April 2024 would an individual act in such a horrific manner. Have police made any referrals to Queensland Health in relation to mental health? So that, uh, I'll, I'll say it again, is that all the, all the contact with police is being collated and reviewed and shared with New South Wales Police Service and the police force rather and that will form their investigations before the state coroner. The last interaction was December 2023. Prior to that, can you give us a rough number of how many interactions he had with police? The majority of the contact he's had with police has been over the last four years from 2020 onwards and it's different type of contact. And when was, was the random? last time he contacted his family? The last contact with the family was in March, to my understanding. So there's been limited contact with his family in terms of phone calls or texts. He would periodically text his mother with an update to where he was. Did he have the family of his son? He didn't have a partner or children? Uh, to my knowledge, he is a single man with no family. It's been reported that he had an active session and his family had taken away um, his knives. Um, did he ever call the cops on his family because they took away his knives? Uh, we're aware of an event in 2023 which we're investigating, but again, that forms part of the more broader inquiries into uh, his conduct, his health, um, his interaction with treating practitioners. Uh, and. Uh, his recent whereabouts in New South Wales, where he may be living and what what changed from a person who's 40 uh, and has for a number of years functioned in society to commit such horrific crime. I think they're the important questions for the New South Wales Police Force and they're the ones certainly we're working closely with to assist them in all our information, all our inquiries. Uh, it is, they're the lead agency, they're the lead investigation uh, and it's important that uh, we're able to sit down with the New South Wales Police Force uh, and assist them in, in compiling the history of this individual which goes before a coroner to assess. What happened in that 2023 incident that he's involved in violence? As I said, every interaction is subject to the information sharing with the New South Wales Police Force and, and that with others will form that part of their investigation. It's, it's early in their investigation and it's a complex investigation for them. So um, they will come to Queensland and we will share further information. We've shared our intelligence overnight and been working with them since yesterday. So police knew about his knife possession? Did they know about his um, obsession with knives previously? I'll say it again and I, what I can say is that we've had contact with this individual involved in committing these crimes uh, primarily over the last four or five years and we know from those contacts he has mental health. Um, we responded to an event in early 2023 uh, with he and his family and that will form subject of the investigations. But he's never been charged with any offence relating to knife, never been found in possession of knives uh, in a manner that's unlawful that would warrant prosecution. Are police um, aware of any links to any um, conservative uh, Christian religious groups at all? No, and I can reaffirm that the New South Wales Police Force, uh, as the lead agency in this investigation, have spoken on that. There is no ideology that would suggest this matter is has a religious focus, uh, has a political focus, or any ideology or religious motivation to our understanding that would contribute to an individual going into a, a crowded place and committing a crime of this nature. So what, no. What mental health issues do you think that's 
uh, well, that's a matter for the New South Wales Police Force to investigate, and that's a matter for they will need to seek information from treating practitioners and Queensland Health, who have provided a statement. Was family cool. aware of why uh, he moved? Oh. Was family aware of why he moved to Sydney? He has led an itinerant lifestyle over the last number of years where he's come and gone from Brisbane or Carina or the Gold Coast, where major that's been primarily where the locations where the Queensland Police Service has had interaction, uh, frequently back to his parents' residence in the Southern Police region. He's not he's forty years of age. He lives independently of his parents. So he's not in regular contact with them or they were aware he was interstate, but they don't have regular contact with him, and it's not uh, the lifestyle of being itinerant and being away from home is not something that they knew where he was uh, at every given day or what stage of treatment he may well or not been under or what his health was at that time. So they were aware he was not in Queensland through tests, but not aware of where or how or whom he may have been associating or living with or where he may have been. Do Queensland Police have any information that might assist in, in why he seemed to target women in particular? No. Thank you. All right, the Assistant Commissioner there in Queensland um, providing quite a considerable amount of new information there and certainly contributing now to the timeline with a better understanding of 40-year-old Joel Gauci. Um, particularly in recent months, it would seem to be that, the, um, as the Assistant Commissioner indicated there, a number of police interactions over the last few years, nothing criminal, but certainly checks on the street. Uh, they're called street checks. Uh, where they're able to check on people, ask them questions, seek intelligence from them. And most recently, um, Angela, in December 2023, uh, some interactions uh, involving his family who were aware that he was interstate. Yes. Uh, specifically asked questions about reports that he was known to be fascinated with knives and that perhaps the uh, parents had tried to take knives off him. Uh, he sort of said that was part of the investigation and talked about that sort of situation happening early 2023, but didn't elaborate too much on that. Uh, the thing I guess that stood out most to me was just a tragedy on for the family as well because clearly they they said that the, they'd seen the video on television rang police and actually um, offered their condolences to obviously the victims people who've been injured and also their thoughts to the female police officer yeah. who shot dead their son and how she's coping it's today. It's clearly a harrowing situation for them uh, as well uh, but obviously a, a bit more clarity on the timeline and uh, diagnosed uh, he just kept on referring to it the police officer as mental health it's been reported as schizophrenia um, that Joel Couch diagnosed when he was 17, but a deterioration of some kind to the point where, and particularly in Sydney, uh, was either living uh, in a car or at backpackers. The family's just not aware. So hard then to track um, how his mental health was either being managed or otherwise and clearly not. Exactly. It uh, the... And it would certainly seem like they were trying to reach out to him yeah. and, as they said, he would only respond sporadically to text messages from his mum. Difficult for them to help manage. In our continuing live coverage, we'll obviously bring you every live press conference as they happen. There's going to be regular updates as well. Uh, the New South Wales Premier Chris Minns is out and about uh, visiting uh, various forms of the emergency services who responded uh, to that scene yesterday afternoon. So we'll bring you those as they happen. Another interview with the Premier as well. No doubt there'll be more information out of Queensland now that more is known about Joel Couchy and those people around him. I would believe that more people will fill in the picture about his personality or state of mind uh, in the last year or so um, to add to the picture here. Let's now, though, go to our reporter, Sarah Jane Bell, uh, who's at the Westfield Bondi Junction. Uh, and Sarah, look, I guess two things playing out there. You still have a crime scene, but obviously very visibly behind you, a growing memorial. Absolutely. And overall, just mostly an outpouring of grief. You can see the floral tributes behind me. They have continued to grow throughout the day. Hundreds of bunches are now here laid for those victims from people who knew them, from locals, from others who were here facing that horrifying act yesterday afternoon, and from people who weren't involved at all but felt they needed to come down and to pay their respects. I think maybe the health minister here put it best of all that perhaps the country today woke up with more 
questions than answers. But what we do know is that the bravery of those bystanders and those first responders, that did save lives. The police commissioner has asked for patience while they continue this investigation that, as we have just heard, actually spans across two different states. Here at Bondi Junction, it was a scene of chaos last night. Dozens of emergency or services and authorities here, at least 75 paramedics responding. Today at the centre, it's much quieter, but it remains cordoned off as police comb that incredibly broad area for any evidence that they might need as they investigate exactly why this happened. Now, what we do know is that six people were killed, including five women. Of the 12 people in hospital, we also know at least eight of them are women. The police commissioner says one of the lines of inquiry will be whether women were targeted. Uh, the processing of that crime scene will continue very clearly. This was a very broad incident. There's a lot of footage already out in the media depicting some of what has occurred. So people would understand this is a large crime scene. We need to deal with each and every aspect of that crime scene absolutely uh, in my, my new detail to make sure we get that right. We will do things as quickly as is absolutely practicable, but uh, it will take some time. Now, police are asking anyone who witnessed the attack yesterday and have a vision to come forward. Any information or vision will help with their investigation. Here in Bondi, the crowds do continue to grow. We expect the Premier to be here later this afternoon to lay flowers as well in tribute to those victims. All right, Sarah Jane, thank you. And obviously, we'll keep on coming back to you throughout the afternoon. And that memorial, quite interesting behind you there, significant wreaths uh, being laid. It'll be fascinating to uh, get you to uh, give us an idea of perhaps the messages and the sentiments a little later on. But thank you for that for now. Um, as we know, uh, one of the most heartbreaking stories to emerge, of course, is that of the victim, Ashley Good, uh, that amazing mum, and her baby girl. In what would be her final act as a new mum, she gave her injured nine-month-old to a stranger to go and get help, just to help her, she kept saying. The 38-year-old, as we know now, died in hospital. We want to read you a heartbreaking statement from the partner of Ashley Good. Um, it's quite incredible. He's also, of course, the father of this baby who, ha who is injured. Uh, it reads, Today we are reeling from the terrible loss of Ashley, a beautiful mother, daughter, sister, partner, friend, all round outstanding human and so much more. We appreciate the well wishes and thoughts of members of the Australian public who have expressed an outpouring of love for Ashley and our baby girl. We are so grateful for the expert care and attention of the medical team at Sydney Children's Hospital. We would also like to thank the New South Wales Police for their kindness and diligence in this tragedy and emergency services, for getting our baby the care she needed as quickly as possible. To the two men who held and cared for our baby when Ashley could not, words cannot express our gratitude. All right, let's go to our reporter Taylor Aitken, who's live at St Vincent's Hospital, just one of the many hospitals across the city treating the patients. Uh, Taylor, look, there have been some developments throughout the morning about the number of people in hospital, in intensive care and who went where. I'm guessing you've got an update for us on this. Yes, Michael and Angela, good afternoon. With the latest update we have from New South Wales Health is that 11 people remain in hospital and they are spread across four different hospitals here in Sydney and as well the Sydney Children's Hospital where that nine-month-old baby girl is being treated. Now, we did learn uh, this morning that her condition has improved since surgery overnight. She's now listed as stable. Three patients remain here at St Vincent's Hospital, including two people in their 20s. One is a woman in her 20s. She is still listed as being in a critical condition. Another, a man in his 20s, he is listed as critical but stable. And there is also a woman in her 40s who is listed as stable. She currently has a stab wound to her shoulder. Listed in the other hospitals around Sydney, three of them in the Prince of Wales Hospital, two at uh, Royal, uh, the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, one in Sydney Children's and one at St George Hospital. Paramedics are fielding the load, spreading it right across Sydney so that these people could get the best care possible. Initially last night there was reports that seven people were taken to hospital from the scene. It's now been revealed that 
another uh, four uh, self-presented to hospital as well as medical centres uh, dealing with superficial wounds that they sustained during that attack at Bondi Junction. Now, just in the last few minutes or so, we have seen the Premier, Chris Minns, along with Ryan Park, visit uh, St Vincent's Hospital here in Darlinghurst. And we spoke to them on their way out. They mentioned that this was not a time to be visiting uh, the families or those that were injured. Some of them are still receiving life-saving care. But this was to meet with the incredible health professionals that stepped up, that do this every day in order to treat the people who were brought here uh, to the hospital. Let's have a listen to what Ryan Park, the New South Wales Minister for Health, had to say. It was an opportunity just for the Premier and I to touch base with staff and just to say uh, thank you. Um, we know that there was multiple patients transferred here uh, last night and um, the staff like they have across all their health facilities have uh, performed miracles in many ways and it was just a small opportunity just to say thank you to um, the men and women who have no doubt saved lives. Were you able to talk to any of the families that are up there next to their loved ones? No, um, we didn't do that. We were just trying to more touch base with staff at this stage. Uh, family will obviously work through that uh, with police and with the support services we have in place. Um, our focus is obviously on looking after them and caring uh, for them. But today was just an opportunity to say thank you. I think on behalf of a nation, to be honest, uh, about some of, not all, some of the, the incredibly skillful surgeons and clinical staff who literally saved people's lives in the most horrendous of circumstances uh, last night. There were more than six dozen mm. Um, mm. paramedics, doctors mm. on scene. What does that go to show about the incredible work that these people do in the field in such a terrible situation? It's phenomenal. I said to them last night uh, when I uh, went up to their debriefing and there was probably 30 or 40 of them there and I said, I'm very proud of them every day of the week, but last night I think our nation uh, really got an understanding of just how good our frontline paramedics are in this country and our health system is always challenged, sometimes things go wrong but boy oh boy, um, the way in which our skilled health workers performed, the way in which they went about their work under the most difficult of circumstances, circumstances where they didn't even know if another assailant was in the building uh, and they're carrying on emergency procedures uh, to, to, to patients uh, to keep them alive. I think that is um, absolutely phenomenal. The Health Minister also commented on the uh, huge scale of the uh, emergency response that was there yesterday. There were 75 paramedics and doctors that raced to that scene at Bondi Junction not knowing what they were going to confront when they were there. Many of them performing life-saving procedures in the field to attempt to stabilise some of those patients before they could be treated in a hospital setting. The Health Minister has also confirmed that there will be uh, eight mental health uh, officers that will be visiting Bondi Junction at, from a 2 p.m. this afternoon. They will be uniformed. They will be clearly visible for anyone who has been affected by this tragedy, who has maybe lived in the area or who was there yesterday and is there to pay tribute to those who lost their lives. The Premier again this morning saying that if anyone needs help or if anyone needs some support in dealing with this grief that has rocked the city, particularly the eastern suburbs, then do not be afraid to reach out. Michael and Angela. Well, Taylor, thank you for that. And as Angela and I were talking about yesterday, I mean, I'm sure the Minister and the Premier have heard the stories from those dozens of police of, uh, ambulance officers about um, how many of them were stuck in the centre for some time whilst the call went out from their inspector saying stay with your patients, don't move. Because at that point, for a short period, they just didn't know uh, whether the attacker was still on the move or whether there was more people. So for those ambulance officers, the paramedics on the scene, uh, there must have been, and I'm sure they were calm, but I'm sure there was a terrifying few minutes where they just didn't know what was going on, still working on patients. So uh, the leaders will be hearing all about those stories. Yes. And there is praise this afternoon for the police inspector who single-handedly took down the killer. Uh, Detective Inspector Amy Scott has been identified as that extraordinarily brave officer. Witnesses say she yelled at him to put it down, but when he charged at her, she fired a gun to stop his murderous rampage. The police commissioner noting her enormous courage. But also... The actions of Inspector Amy Scott had no doubt prevented the loss of additional lives. 
the police commissioner there, uh, Karen Webb. Sorry, Angela, you were going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that what was remarkable um, is that when she spoke to her, it was just humility yeah. and talking about the brave shoppers She was grateful the for the people running behind her to like, help. Yeah. All those people who had her back, um, and that's what she said. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Uh, another uh, reporter is Angela Gopi standing by in the city. Um, Angel, you've been uh, at St Mary's Cathedral. Obviously, it is Sunday morning. A lot of the services across the city, the state, the nation have been reflecting on this terrible incident today, but a very special ceremony there for the victims and a march. Mm, that is right, Michael, and that march has just concluded. We've just heard a, a lovely chorus here at St Mary's Cathedral in the CBD. It followed what was a solemn mass that began at, at 10.30, led by Reverend Archbishop Anthony Fisher. So many people came here today to pay their respects. Uh, what is normally a day, a mass of, say, 300 people, today we saw a crowd of more than 2,000 people, especially special message from uh, the Archbishop. Let's take a listen. At a time of universal grief and horror at the multiple murders and injuries at Bondi Junction yesterday, including the stabbing of a baby, as well as celebration of the courage of the baby's mother, the policewoman and other bystanders, we reflect upon our community's profound commitment to the value of every human life. There was a special march up and down Macquarie Street that went to State Parliament and they are, uh, the crowd is just here now behind me. Uh, so many of them, hundreds, would be young families who today uh, were speaking to me about uh, the what if. What if it was them who uh, were inside that Westfield shopping centre? Uh, let's take a listen to some of those emotional uh, mothers and, and those who were here this morning. It's been quite disturbing and um, confronting So, because we know someone who's in the shopping centre who left at about 3.15 so it seems very real when that happened and today in the church mass I went to the priest prayed for all the people who had passed away or who were affected or traumatised by it. I was devastated um, just to that horror of those people running through it's just my imagination went wild and I just I just went into prayer. That's all I could do. I think it really shocked the whole city of Sydney, all the people. An outpouring of grief, and it just goes to show how many Sydney siders are now turning to leaders uh, and to faith to guide them through what is such a tragic time. Yes, where they can find comfort. Thanks so much, Angelique. The Prime Minister says we saw the best of Australians springing into action in the face of danger. Let's go live now to political reporter Isabel Mullen. Izzy, how did Anthony Albanese respond this morning? Good afternoon, guys. The Prime Minister was very sombre and measured this morning. He attended St Christopher's Church service in Canberra around 8, speaking to us afterwards and reiterating his disbelief at the senseless loss of life. He spoke at length about the horrific nature of the murders, uh, but we really got a sense this morning he wanted to highlight the extraordinary bravery that the victims, police and members of the public displayed as this was all unfolding. We know Manny, Manny ran towards the danger. We've seen that vision and put their own lives at risk in a bid to save others. He said, and I quote, this was the best of Australians amidst this extraordinary tragedy. He confirmed he's spoken to a number of world leaders who have expressed their sadness and condolences. US President Joe Biden, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and New Zealand's PM Christopher Luxon are among them closest to home. Mr Luxon has said Australia is family. All New Zealanders are thinking of those affected by the tragic events in Bondi. Here's the Prime Minister. We also, though, at this time, give thanks to our police and emergency services, uh, the wonderful inspector who ran into danger by herself and removed the threat that was there to others uh, without thinking about the risk to herself. We also see the footage of ordinary Australians putting themselves in harm's way in order to help their fellow citizens. Uh, that bravery was quite extraordinary that we saw yesterday 
uh, the best of Australians amidst this extraordinary tragedy. Mr Albanese confirmed he's spoken to authorities and has been briefed that mental health is a factor at play. We heard in that press conference last night here in Parliament that he'd spoken to the ASIO chief. He wouldn't provide any other details aside from what police have publicly stated so far. The Prime Minister finishing by encouraging people to reach out and ask for help and support if they need it. Guys. OK, thanks so much, Izzy. Well, in all of that chaos yesterday, heroes emerged, that is very clear, and one of them is Andrew Reid. After the shutters came down at the My Department store where he was seeking refuge, he spotted a woman in desperate need of help, and without hesitation, the brave father of three, trained in all sorts of uh, medical help, asked to be let out so that he could provide first aid. We spoke to him on Sunrise earlier. Andrew, thanks so much for, for being with us. You must still be reeling this morning and, and also with the information that, in fact, you knew Ash Good, the 38-year-old mother of nine-month-old Harriet, who, um, and Ash has passed away. Yeah, not much sleep last night. Um, yeah, I... Yeah, it's... it's um, I just really feel for Dan, Liam, his brother, and their whole family. Um, and it's good to hear the news that, that Harriet's stabilising. Jeez, uh, look, Andrew, you did an extraordinary thing last night. You've got that incredible skill set as, as a Bondi lifeguard. Um, you've encountered a lot of medical episodes, but you knew you had some skills. You knew you could help. Would you be able to talk us through, please, exactly what you did? Because you were inside the mire when the shutters came down. What did you do next? Uh, yeah, I, yeah well, I just asked to be let out because I, I could just see the lady on level four and there was a lot of blood. There was a couple of people helping her, but I just knew that we really needed, had, needed to stop the bleeding. So they let me out and, um, and I just went around the corner of the escalators and what I saw was just horrific. Like, it was just multiple victims spread out over, like, 50-metre distances. And, and so I, I went and first helped with the two people that were helping the other lady and we just... There was so much blood that we just thought there was more wounds, but I think she just had a really bad one on, her, on, on the back of her right shoulder blade, which we stopped the bleeding there, and, and the other two were doing a great job, as well as the police. But at this time, the police were, were running around everywhere. They thought there was... I think they thought there was two um, uh, attackers, so that was kind of a little bit nerve-wracking. But I guess we just... One, once we realised she was stable, um, I went to the next one because she was in a really bad way and there was two police officers working on her and I thought if I can relieve them and allow them to go and, to go and try and find the, what we thought was a second attacker, then you know, I was helping and, and we did some CPR on her and then some ambulance officers arrived and we did a little bit more CPR, but she was in a really bad way. Um, she, she'd lost a lot of blood. Andrew, I, I understand from, from th that you saw an empty pram now, now, in all of this and all of the victims, you know, it's nine-month-old Harriet and we're told from witnesses that he actually attacked Harriet, we think, first in that pram. Was that Harriet's pram that you saw? I have no idea. I, I, I didn't know that... Um uh, Ash and, and the ba there was no baby there. It was just an empty pram, and I just thought, oh my god, what I what is that doing here? Like, and I, I actually at first thought it was the woman that I just worked on, the second woman. Then I was when I was walking to the third victim, um, and uh, I found out. Obviously, I found out later it wasn't. But I mean, it, it's just devastating to think that someone could do something like yeah. that to anybody, let alone a baby. Andrew, you know, in some of the vision, it's, it's so confusing to try and understand what was behind this person's motive. That'll be discussed for days to come. But uh, at points, he avoided people. At other points, he clearly attacked in the space where you were. And, and it sounds like he might have just come at them from behind. Just going to interrupt what we were playing back there because the Prime Minister, we understand, let's have a look at this vision now, uh, is at the uh, scene now with the New South Wales Premier, Chris Minns. Let's just have a listen in there for a minute. We won't do that quite yet. The audio is not connected, but uh, well, they are there, uh, obviously, with some of the police hierarchy um, to lay some flowers and some wreaths. Just, just have a listen to some of the comments of the prime minister. Well, yeah. So it's not clear who the Prime Minister is speaking with. Um, we can only assume uh, some of the witnesses were involved yesterday. 
who may have helped in that situation. Nonetheless, he's there to offer support. And as he said yesterday, Australia, you know, strong together. Um, so he was in church this morning in Canberra, which we uh, saw earlier in our coverage, uh, has flown to Sydney to be there with the uh, New South Wales Premier, who we know had gone to Tokyo, turned around in the airport and came straight back uh, to help lead some of the coverage. Um, I understand they're about to lay some flowers or a wreath as well. They'd only just arrived on the scene. Uh, we'll go back to that vision right now and start having a look at it. There'll be a little bit of a ceremony here. Um, you can see in the distance there the bouquets instead. Uh, Kelly Conley there, Kelly Sloan, she is, uh, the member, the state member in that area as well. Uh, there's a growing memorial there, yeah. Angela, as, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, you can see Allegra Spender there as well. Um, yeah, as you're saying, this growing memorial and people just coming down feeling like they want to show their condolences. Listen, listen. Obviously, uh, the Prime Minister there with the Premier uh, laying some flowers, some bouquets at what will be a growing memorial uh, just outside in the, in the part of the mall in Bondi Junction, uh, opposite where the Westfield Centre is, and the Prime Minister uh, taking a chance to just speak to some of the people there, maybe some people who were there yesterday, but certainly people who are gathering today yeah. uh, to come and be connected uh, to what happened there and, and share their love and support. Yeah, it's quite interesting the people we've seen go down there this morning. Um, either they weren't even there necessarily the day before, just going down to pay their respects. Um, it, and, and also what struck me as well, you'll remember, Michael, when we were sitting here last night and that those quite distressing video um, surfaced of people just running down through that mall where those flowers are now laying um, with just sheer panic. Um, and obviously the mood down there has changed today. Very sombre. Thankfully, some calm in that area after just an atrocious day yesterday. Uh, this is the Prime Minister speaking with the local mayor, the state member there, Kelly Sloan, Allegra Spender, the federal member uh, for Wentworth in that area as well. So the various political leaders, as you'd expect, uh, coming together to share a few stories. Um, there is going to be an extraordinary amount of coordination with all of these people behind the scenes as they learn more uh, from the investigators. As we heard from the earlier press conference, New South Wales Police, of course, taking the lead, but with significant help from Queensland Police, a little bit of help from the Australian Federal Police, uh, and that will be in some of the digital forensic recovery of perhaps this, uh, this person's background, although we're getting a very clear picture fast of his uh, personal story. Um, but the Prime Minister just sharing a few stories here with the local political uh, leaders in the area, state, federal and local. And what is a really difficult day, obviously, for the country watching this, but particularly people who obviously live in that area and are locals and walking past there. It's very... Um, very difficult that it, it, I mean, it was just so unexpected. No one would have thought this would happen in Australia, alone you know, in someone's backyard, the people there. So, a difficult day for all. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, um, Angela, if the Prime Minister does similar to the Premier, without getting in the way, of course, but uh, spend some time speaking to the uh, ambulance crews, perhaps some of the uh, frontline police, although they'll still be flat out, uh, who responded yesterday. And I know the Prime Minister had a particular message yesterday, repeated this morning, too. Uh, for the workers, for the uh, shop workers, uh, many of them whom are in their mid-teens, late-teens as well, who not only experienced the trauma of what happened inside the Westfield, but did some pretty amazing acts of courage themselves by pulling down the shutters, protecting their customers inside the stores. Uh, the Prime Minister having a particularly... Uh, no, a note of care in his words and language for those workers who were on shift yesterday that had to experience this and, in the face of an absolutely terrible event, did good. Good people yes. standing up and trying to help out. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Prime Minister tries to extend a word or two for all of those people involved in the retail uh, industry inside Westfield who did so much good yesterday. Yes, a message he keeps repeating um, that this, you know, we saw the best in Australians. We've seen 
some of the worst, but saw the best in Australians' way. They rallied together, they were brave, they came together strong, um, and he'll want it. Yeah, in fact, Allegra Spender, who's speaking uh, to the left of screen there, she made that comment this morning, Angela, during Sunrise. She said, you know, one person did a terrible thing, hundreds raced in the other direction to do the very good thing. Um, it was beautifully put by all the leaders at the moment and so true. Uh, so the Prime Minister, just sharing a yarn, hearing a few of the local stories, because no doubt uh, Allegra Spender and the local mayor there are uh, getting them directly from all of their constituents, um, Kelly Sloan as well. All right, that's the Prime Minister in Bondi Junction. Um, we just thought we'd bring that to you live at the moment. As we heard from the Prime Minister earlier, I don't know if there's, there's another planned update later in the day. He'll be leaving a lot of it to the state authorities now to release the information as the day goes on. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the Pope has just sent condolences in a telegram to the Archbishop of Sydney. The Vatican said His Holiness Pope Francis was deeply saddened to learn of the violent attack in Sydney and he sends the assurance of his spiritual closeness to all affected by this senseless tragedy, especially those who are now mourning the loss of a loved one. He likewise offered his prayers for the dead, the injured as well as the first responders and invokes upon the nation the divine blessings of consolation and strength. There's also been statements from the Royal Family, which I don't know whether we have them yet or not, but we'll bring those up in the course of the broadcast as well, uh, from the King, from the Prince and Princess of Wales as well. So we'll bring you those when we get them. Mm. Sydney is in a state of shock this afternoon, as much as Australia. Let's um, bring in Dr Anna Brooks, who is with Lifeline. Anna, how much does an incident like this impact witnesses and first responders, firstly? Deeply. Thank you for having me. Um, deeply. Uh, as the emergency response um, uh, uh, draws to a close, the psychological impacts, the distress that's caused by uh, this tragic event, um, unfortunately, will start to, to manifest uh, with those who were directly involved, but also the local community uh, and those uh, who are hearing about these, um, these tragic stories. So uh, it really is a factor that we have to be very mindful of. Uh, and I my main message today is please reach out for support. Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week on 13 11 14, our chat and text services. So uh, please don't hesitate to, to seek support. Dr Brooks, one of the, the things that worried me this morning when we've been talking about it and in our extensive coverage is that we know that our first responders, the ambulance officers and the police are highly trained uh, for every scenario, including a mass event like this, no matter the exact nature of it, but they know how to handle this. But nothing mm. can quite prepare them for the immediate um, shock of what they're witnessing. Uh, we certainly heard from the Bondi lifesaver, Andrew Reid, who is dealing with first aid all the time down on the beaches and all sorts of medical mm. episodes, and he just said he has never seen blood like it. Um, mm. It was overwhelming. I just am concerned deeply that no matter how well you're trained, you can get deeply affected by this. Absolutely. I, I, at the end of the day, we're all humans uh, and training, as important as it is, um, prepares you to a certain degree. But uh, the, the scenes that people were witnessing yesterday and that we're hearing about today and in the days to come are obviously deeply distressing. Um, so, you know, even for those people who have had uh, that sort of training, I you know, really encourage them if they're, if they're feeling like their coping mechanisms are overwhelmed, um, please reach out to sources of support. And also children and young people. We saw those mm. images that we, we've all seen and we've all talked about with the father who covered his, um, his daughter's eyes with sort of sleeping masks so that they couldn't see them with the tag still on. He obviously just grabbed them off a shelf somewhere. Um, quite mm. clever, I guess, to try and shield them from what they, you know, just the awful things they would have seen walking out of that shopping centre. But there would have been so many kids down there, teenagers. How scarring... Could it be what they've been through and witnessed? Look, I think for all of us, and particularly particularly young people, uh, this is you know very distressing, and we do have to think about trying to um, support them in particular. Um, some of the things um, that I, I think are important to be mindful of are managing the the exposure to the information about this event. Obviously, you know most people are online. Um, information is fairly freely available, but um, particularly as a parent or caregiver at the moment, be a good idea to keep an eye on the amount of content that young people are, um, are exposed to. Um, also give young people the opportunity uh, as a parent or caregiver 
to ask questions, to speak about it, and um, and uh, share information with them in an age-appropriate way, um, but also reassure them that they're safe. Uh, so, you know, some some things that we really uh, can do and, and need to be doing to try, uh, I guess, to um, to make sure that we're supporting young people through this very challenging uh, uh, situation. It is a good point because obviously we've been showing a lot of footage that we've taken from social media, but we have been very careful about what we're showing, so it's not too graphic. We obviously try and be really careful um, with what we do but it, on social media there's so much there it's Kids, unfiltered, it's unfiltered right. and mm. not blurred you can see everything I mean is that something that we should try and keep the kids off so they're not having to see that Look, I think limiting exposure to that absolutely would be a good idea. If that's not possible, then um, engaging, like making sure that you're providing an opportunity for young people to, to talk and try to process and uh, try to um, acknowledge their thoughts and feelings about um, about what they've seen. Um, and as I said, also try to try to link that back to reassuring messages and and um, you know and let them know that they are safe. Dr. Book, just on a positive, because we saw some vision before of the growing uh, floral memorial down in Bondi Junction. There, there, there is some nice therapy, isn't there, in uh, acts of nice thought, like they're doing down there. Even if you don't want to go there directly, you can still express that in other ways, you know, within your family or communities or at your church this morning, as many people have been doing. There are ways just to let a bit of it out and show care, right? Absolutely. I think that, that, that can be a very positive thing. Um, planting a, a tree, uh, you know, writing a card, um, people laying, laying down, uh, you know, garlands of flowers. So those sorts of acts can, can really, uh, I guess, start to um, uh, highlight the best of humanity um, under these, these really awful circumstances. Yeah. Well said. All right. Lovely to have you on in terrible circumstances, unfortunately, though. But uh, nice advice there, Dr Anna Brooks from Lifeline. Thank you. Thank you. And we should, of course, mention if anyone uh, does feel like they need uh, to talk to someone, the lifeline number 13 11 14. Don't be afraid to get in touch if you need. Well, 12 people were injured by the killer, many of them undergoing emergency treatment, as we've learned. The reporter Taylor Aitken, uh, who we interviewed a little minute ago, has talked to one young man whose mother was stabbed and has just been released from hospital. Explain to us what, how she's feeling at the moment. Um, she, yeah, she just left now, um, but she's uh, in good spirits, which is good. How scary was that for you to find out? Um, I, I'm still shaking thinking of it now. It's um, probably yeah, a horrible experience for my whole family, my, my dad and my, my two siblings. It was um, a horrible feeling and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And you live locally to Bondi Junction, do you? Yeah, just... Somewhere uh, that you go often? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a surprise. You know, you see these things on the news and, you know, and you wouldn't think it would happen to, you know, in the area where we live, especially, you know, your own mother. And your mum's recovering, she's OK. What do you have to say to her? you happy she's here? Yeah, I'm happy, you know. I'm happy that she's alive. There's six people, seven including the... Um, Joel, the guy who did it, um, but count, definitely counting our blessings that she's still here and alive and breathing and still with us. So. And have they given you any indication of her recovery? She'll be okay? Um, yeah, she'll be okay. Just uh, it'll be a slow process. She's a grateful young man there, and his mum, who's just been released, stabbed in the back. In the she back. was. So, yeah. That's quite remarkable that she's already been allowed out. So, again, well, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, it shows what the medical, medical teams, teams have been, have able been to doing do overnight, and and perhaps in her case, bad, but but more superficial than the other people, because we understand two people are still critical. But gosh, for that family uh, and for that young son there to be in that situation today, uh, still shaking. He said. Yeah. Yeah. Awful. Uh, it's been revealed that Ashley Good, the new mother stabbed to death at Westfield, was the daughter of a former AFL player. Live to Rory Campbell in Melbourne. Rory, the club released a statement. What's it said? Angela, the trauma of what happened at Bondi Junction yesterday is rippling right through the Australian rules football community today. Ashley Good was the daughter of Kerry Good, a former player at North Melbourne who played more than 70 games for the club in the 70s and 80s. He was also a director there during one of its most success successful periods in the 90s. The club has released a statement, President Dr Sonia Hood saying, to learn later that Ashley and her daughter were victims in this tragedy really brings something like this close to home. Kerry and his family 
family are incredibly important people in our club's history and we offer them our love and support through what is an unimaginably difficult time. Now the North Melbourne Football Club has offered the Good family the chance for its players to wear black armbands today in the game against Geelong here at GMHBA State. The sadness of this spreads far wider than just the North Melbourne Football Club. Uh, the AFL has put out its own statement to CEO Andrew Dillon expressing his sadness and offering condolences to all those affected, saying, you shudder when you hear the news on Saturday and find it hard to comprehend that an activity that's so normal and so common to every Australian family could end so tragically. Uh, the uh, heroism and selflessness that Ashley Good uh, showed yesterday as she tried to save her nine-month-old daughter Harriet's life is in the minds of so many people here at Geelong. Sadly, Ashley Good didn't make it. Her nine-month-old daughter Harriet is still at Sydney Children's Hospital after having had surgery. And what they all both went through is very much on the minds of the football community and those uh, out on the field here today at GMHBA Stadium. OK, Rory there. Thank you very much for that uh, today. We're going to take a look at um, today's other big story. There's been a lot of news happening. Iran launching what's described as a fleet of suicide drones and missiles towards Israel. Let's go live now to our US Bureau Chief, David Roywood. Uh, David, hello to you from here. Now, some of them have been shot down, but what's the situation? Good afternoon, Michael. Yes, uh, look, uh, the good news is that those airstrikes, uh, they have dried up in the past few hours with the Israeli Defence Force claiming to have intercepted a majority of those 200 suicide drones and missiles fired from Iran. And we've seen those images there of the Iron Dome working overtime. Look, it's still early and the damage is still being assessed, but reports coming out of Israel this morning are that nobody was killed in this widespread attack. It's quite remarkable, but how that now weighs into Israel's, Israel's response we will have to wait and see. Few anticipate this attack will go unpunished. US President Joe Biden and the Israeli PM Netanyahu, they have spoken tonight. And, of course, the US President has spent much of the day locked in the Situation Room with his national security team and advisers. Look, Israel had been anticipating this attack. We know that. They were ready. They told us that after Iran had promised retribution for the presumed Israeli strike on the Damascus embassy just last week. Uh, this is an extraordinarily delicate moment for the Middle East. That can't be overstated. The US president has just released a statement praising Israel's capacity to defend itself and again warning it was uh, remaining vigilant to all threats. Uh, what that means exactly? Well, we expect that to become clearer in the coming hours. But the Israeli Defence Force, uh, they have responded to this a short time ago. We are closely monitoring Iranian killer drones that are en route to Israel sent by Iran. This is a severe and dangerous escalation. Our defensive and offensive capabilities are at the highest level of readiness ahead of this large-scale attack from Iran. Now we have seen scenes of celebration across parts of the Middle East today. What makes this attack from uh, Iran unusual is that Iran has fired these drones and these uh, missiles directly from its own territory. It has not relied, as it usually does, on regional proxies. So this is a major development on that side of the conflict. Look, Iran's UN delegation has released a statement today saying that the matter can be deemed concluded. However, should this Israeli regime make another mistake. Iran's response will be considerably more severe. It is a conflict between Iran and the rogue Israeli regime from which the US must stay away. And that is the major point confronting the region now. How will the US and Israel respond? OK, David, there, our US Bureau Chief um, talking to us about that Middle East uh, tension as well. Thank you for that. Well, still to come, our special coverage of the mass murder at the Bondi Junction continues. The Bondi Junction Massacre. Saturday shopping turned to scenes of terror. Seven News continues to bring you the latest information as it breaks. Complete coverage at six and the very latest after Spotlight. All the details on Seven News.